<laughs> Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We, uh, our message this morning, and I'm going to have you turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Our message this morning, morning is entitled, The Unity of the Spirit. The Unity of the Spirit. And on the back table, we have a brochure with this morning's lesson of the unity of the Spirit. This is going to be one of the more important messages that, that I've shared. I think they're all important. Uh, but this is one of the more important, more critically important messages that we're going to share this morning. So please turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And as we begin this morning, we're going to focus our attention on the Word of God. And so we should. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. That's what the Word of God says. Why? That the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished and fitted for every good work. If we're going to serve God, we need to understand God's Word. Right? We don't depend on our feelings and our emotions. Your feelings and your emotions can lie to you, can deceive you. We're only safe with God's Word. We're only safe with God's Word when it's rightly divided. Amen? Amen. Amen. Turn to chapter 4 of Ephesians. This letter to the church at Ephesus was written by Paul. Paul the Apostle. The Apostle to the Gentiles. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. You remember, Paul had been arrested. Paul was literally in chains. Paul ended up dying a martyr's death. His last book is 2 Timothy. Paul was executed. He had his head cut off. I don't know if you know that. Paul was executed. Paul died the death of a martyr. Paul is in chains, and he mentions himself as the prisoner of the Lord some of the books, some of the letters. And he mentions it here in Ephesians. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. This word vocation has to do with our calling. Did you know that you have a calling? Now you'll look at a minister and you'll say, well, that pastor has a calling. He was called by God to preach. We hope he was called by God to preach. After I listen to the message, I can generally tell whether he was called or not. Amen? Amen. He may have called himself. But um, we all have a calling from God as believers in Christ. And you have a ministry, and God wants to use you in that ministry. So part of our, our walk and our vocation is going to be beginning to understand what is my role as a member of the body of Christ? What am I supposed to be doing? Well, step one is to show up. Right? As a saved person, you know Christ. You have to show up so that you can sit under the teaching and get the Word of God rightly divided and begin to grow in grace and to discover your gifts and talents and how God would like to use you. Well, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. How do we walk worthy? He's going to tell us in verse 2. With all lowliness, humility, by the way, he's talking about humility here. We're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We live in a day where people love titles. I'm Dr. so and so I have this degree, and I have that degree, and I've written so many books. I've written some books, too, but I don't run around telling people. I've written 18 books. I've been published. I've been in so many magazines, and on and on and on and on and on. We're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Let someone else toot your horn. Let someone else tell folks you've won this award and you won that award. You don't need to run around telling people. Most people don't even know that I'm a minister, that I'm a pastor. They certainly know that I'm a Christian. I'm very quick 
to lift up and to exalt the name of the Lord and to promote the Word of God. I don't need to promote myself. Amen. How are we to walk? We are to walk with all lowliness and meekness. That's how we're to walk. We're to walk in humility. He says, with long suffering. We're to be very patient with each other. Sometimes we have a very short fuse with other people. Sometimes members of our own family. Sometimes it's a boyfriend, sometimes it's a girlfriend, not necessarily just a husband or a wife. We need to be long-suffering and patient with each other. Think about how many times God has forgiven you for all the things that you've done. You've, you've committed some sin, whatever the trend of your sin nature is, thousands and thousands of times. And guess what? God has forgiven and forgotten each time, forgiven and forgotten each time. He doesn't hold anything against you. How quick we are to judge each other, right? And and to exact something out of your your own brother, your own sister in Christ. We're to be long suffering. We're to be humble. We're to be patient. That's how we're to walk. With all holiness and meekness and long suffering, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. The love of God constrains me that I can forgive, that I cannot hold anything against another brother and another sister. Amen? Amen. And then verse 3, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what, that's what God wants. He wants us, I'm going to read verse 3 again, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now here we are, saved people, members of the body of Christ. We're not Jews living under the law of Moses. That's not our identification. We are members of the body of Christ. Is Jesus Christ the Messiah? Yes, He is. But we don't know Him as the Messiah. We know Him in our relationship with Him as the head of the body. That's how we relate to the Lord Jesus Christ. As the risen Lord, who's already been crucified, who's already risen, and who is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond, this thing that holds us together. What is the glue that holds us together? We're to be bound together in peace. We're to maintain the peace. When I counsel husbands, uh, because marriage can be a difficult thing. Marriage can be a stressful thing. Relationships can be difficult and stressful. And if you're over 18 years old, well, nowadays you can say 12 years old, you've been in some kind of a relationship, haven't you? Right? Yes, yeah, sure you have. We're to, we're to keep the peace. We're to maintain peace. We're not supposed to be arguing and fighting all the time. I raised two daughters. And sometimes the girls didn't get along with each other. Sometimes they would fight with each other. And I would pull them aside and I would say to them, the mature person is the one who apologizes first. The spiritually mature person is the one who, who strives to maintain the peace. Oh, they would rush to apologize to each other. Oh, I'm the mature one. I'm the spiritually mature one. I'm saying I'm sorry first. And I jokingly say to husbands, the words, especially after performing a marriage ceremony, husband, the thing you need to, to survive in your relationship is to learn the words, yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear, you're right, dear. I'm sorry, dear. Be humble. Learn how to apologize. Learn how to put the other person before yourself. Well, we're going to look at seven things this morning, seven key important things. Paul says, beginning in verse 4, and I'm going to read 4 all the way through 6. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to address each item one at a time. Seven things we're going to look at this morning. And I'm hoping that I have your undivided attention. This is really important information. We could have seven messages just on these seven points. I don't have seven weeks in a row. We share the pulpit with my brother Julius. So I'm going to try to squeeze all seven in this morning. There's so much more that could be said about each one of these seven points. Uh, but we're going to do the, 
the abridged version, okay? Chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Well, let's go back. Let's examine all seven one by one. First, Paul says, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God. He says there is one body. Now, you can look around today. You can see hundreds of bodies. You see the Baptist, that's a body, isn't it? That's a body of believers. Some people are saved, some of them aren't saved. You have, you have the American Baptist. You have the Southern Baptist. You've got Free Baptist. You got Baptist, Baptist, Baptist everywhere you turn. Every one of them is trying to don't you get your way. You got Methodists. You've got United Methodists. You've got Episcopalians. You've got Pentecostals. You got Church of God in Christ, the coaching. You, you've got so many different groups. The Word of God says there's one body, not hundreds of bodies. Those bodies are anti-biblical and anti-scriptural. They are against the Word of God. And what are most Christians doing today? They're supporting the dividing and the segmentation of the body of Christ. It's blasphemous. It is anti-scriptural. Am I offending you this morning? Not if you got the Holy Spirit in you. Not if you're a child of God who loves the Word of God. Who loves what the Word says. Your only issue should be what saith the Scripture. What does God say? Not what that pastor down the street has to say. You can walk through this city right here in Syracuse and count this body and that body and this body and that body. There's hundreds of them. Sectioning off and dividing up and marginalizing the body of Christ. And didn't God know the future? God knows the future. God knows what's going to happen. And 2,000 years ago, through our apostle, the apostle Paul, he says there is one body. Do you think God is approving of denominationalism? No, he is not. There is only one body, and that is the body of Christ, of which we are members. One body, folks, only one. Do you belong to a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, a Lutheran church? You're working against God. We've already talked about this a couple of weeks ago in Philippians chapter 3. What does Paul call Christians? Saved people who are supporting a denomination? He calls them enemies of the cross. That's what he calls them. That's what God has to say. He calls them enemies of the cross. Do you want to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ and have the label enemy of the cross? All you have to do is join a Baptist church. Join a Methodist church. Join a Pentecostal church. Join a Lutheran church. Join any denomination of your choice and you have already violated Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. He says there's only one body. We are to support the one body of Christ. That's no denomination at all, by the way, in case you're confused. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he says there's one spirit. Oh, this one should be very easy to figure out, right? That's God, the Holy Spirit. There's only one spirit. But what's the problem with this one spirit? Well, the spirit that's in the Bible is not the spirit that's out there in the world as described by most Christians. Christians describe the Holy Spirit in a mystical way. Mysticism. Occultism. They, they describe the Holy Spirit as some force that comes upon you and you lose control of yourself. They start seeing 
visions in the night and God is speaking to me, not through the Bible, but some extra thing outside of the Word of God. That's not the Holy Spirit. Paul says there's one Spirit, but the Spirit that's in the world is the Spirit of lies and deception. To tap into your feelings and emotions and to lie to you and to confuse you and to keep you away from the Scripture, away from the Word of God, and away from serving the Lord your God. That's the problem today. He says, test the spirits, try the spirits to see whether they're from God or not. Put them to the test. Well, how do you test a spirit? You test a spirit by the Word of God. You have to know the Word of God to be able to use the Word of God to test the spirit to see if it's from God. Well, we can very quickly look at a few examples. Oh, and I've got to be also careful, folks, because I've only got a little bit of time this morning. These are entire messages or series of messages. Just a message on the Spirit alone. Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it, not a force, not a thing. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. And Jesus says, when He comes, He uses the personal pronoun, He. When He comes, He will lead you, He will guide you. He is your teacher, and He is Almighty God. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, they dropped dead. They lied to God. And the apostles said, you haven't lied unto men, you've lied unto God. The Holy Spirit is God. We need to make sure we understand who the Holy Spirit is. The moment that you believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit does a number of things for you. He baptizes you into Christ. We're going to talk about that baptism in just a few minutes here. The Holy Spirit seals you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, until the day God comes and picks your body up, right? You get rid of the tent. The body that you're in right now is called a tent. When Christ came into the world, by the way, in the Gospel of John, in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh. That word in the Greek is skene. It's a tent. He tabernacled with us. He pitched his tent. What an amazing verse that is. He pitched his tent. Our body is called a tent. And one day, we're going to break down the tent, put the tent away. We're going to die. That's called falling asleep, by the way. One day you're going to fall asleep. You're going to pitch your tent. And God's going to give you a new building, a new house to live in. A permanent house. You know a tent. A tent is a temporary place to stay. If you've ever gone camping, you pitch a tent. You pitch the tent and you stay out there in the woods for a couple of days, overnight. But you don't stay there for good. You just pitch your tent and you hang out for a while. That's exactly what we're doing on earth. This is a tent. It's temporary. We'll have more to say on that in just a few minutes, folks. He says there's one body, there's one spirit, and even as you are called in one hope, we have one hope. And Christians are all over the place with their hopes, but there's only one. It's called the blessed hope. Do we know what the blessed hope is? People change the names. They use different words that really aren't in the Bible. They use the word the rapture, the rapture of the church. Well, it's true, there is going to be a removal. The Bible uses the word, and I like to use the expressions that the Bible uses. It uses the, the expression, the blessed hope. What is our blessed hope? Our blessed hope is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to receive us. So that we can discard this tent. We want to get out of the tent and we want to get into our building. God has a building for you. God has a home for you. God has an apartment for you. God has a structure for you. And God is going to meet all of your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. So don't worry about your apartment. Don't worry about your house. God's got you covered. He's got a place for you. You don't have to worry about the lights. You don't have to worry about the electricity. You don't have to worry about the running water. God's got you covered. All you need is faith. This is our hope. Our hope 
is in the resurrection. You know, if you go all the way back to Genesis, <laughs> Satan lied to Adam and Eve. He lied directly to Eve. He said to her, have God said, did God say? Did God say what? That you, that you can't eat of every tree? Yeah, but not that one. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat that one. And then she added, she goes, we can't even touch it lest we'll die. And Satan said, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat from that tree, you're going to be as smart as him. Knowing good and evil. You're going to be as smart as God. You're going to be as God's. And do you know that people have been lying just like Satan ever since? They say, you're not going to die. We, we just went to a funeral service, my brother and I, on Thursday. And every time we go to a funeral service, we hear the same thing. People say, oh, the person that died, he's still with us. He's just on the other side. He's watching us. He's looking down on us. That's not what the Word of God says. God said to Adam, in the day that you eat of that fruit from that tree, you're going to die. Dying, you shall surely die. And that's what they did. They began to die. They died spiritually immediately. And then that, that physical degenerative process of dying continued. Adam lived 930 years and he died. And he fell asleep. And Abraham died and he fell asleep. And Isaac died and he fell asleep with Abraham, his father. They put them in the grave and they fell asleep. But what, what does the church teach today? They take our hope away from us. They, they lie about the hope. They'll tell you that your hope is to, to be absent from the body and to immediately be in the presence of the Lord. That's not what Paul said. Now, if you look carefully at that verse, he's talking about he doesn't want, he would like to be absent from the tent and he'd like to be in possession of the building. Because he said he doesn't want to be naked. He doesn't want to be unclothed, which is another way of saying sleeping. He doesn't want to be dead. He doesn't want to be unclothed. He wants to be in his new building because in the new building he can be face to face with the Lord. You're not face to face with the Lord naked. You're not face to face with the Lord when you're sleeping. And you look at that expression all throughout the Bible, so-and-so died and fell asleep. David died and fell asleep. Solomon died and fell asleep. He says that over and over and over again. Right? What about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? He's sleeping. She said, oh Lord, if you had only hurried up and got here sooner, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in me even though you're dead, yet shall you live. He's the resurrection. There's no life in death, by the way, folks. When you die, you're dead. Christians wonder, what happens to me when I die? Isn't mother still watching me? Isn't she still here? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. From dust you came, from dust you will return. When you die, you go back to the dust. And you have a little dirt nap. That's what you have. You have a dirt nap. You're going to take a little dirt nap. Unless Jesus comes first. Well, I praise God this morning. Today's my birthday. I'm 59 years old. Oh, I'm so glad God put me on the wake-up list this morning, right? He, he woke me up this morning. He kept me alive this morning. He said, oh, Mike's got a sermon. I'm going to let him have another day, right? I'm still here. Praise God. Now, he can take me at any time. I don't have a problem with leaving. But I don't need a dirt man. I need my new body. I need my resurrection body. You're going to be face to face with the Lord. You need a resurrection body. And when Christ returns, at his return, he says, the dead in Christ will rise first. I love Mahala Jackson. I used to listen to her music a lot. Because my parents would pay, play Mahala Jackson as a child. Oh, and she had this song. I just love this song. It's called, she would sing, Ain't it great getting up in the morning? Fairly well, fairly well. She talked about that great getting up morning. That morning when Jesus shows up and we get up. Those who have fallen asleep will get up from the graves. Those who have fallen asleep will be clothed in their new bodies, their resurrection body. 
It will be a great getting up morning. And I believe we're going to see Mahalia Jackson there too. And that great getting up morning. Amen? Amen. We have one hope. And our hope is not to die and then to be awake on the other side without a resurrection body. Like the world teaches. Like a lot of Christian churches teach. That's false doctrine. That's false teaching. If we are to maintain the unity of the spirit, we are to hold to one body, no denomination. We are to hold to the right, correct Holy Spirit. There's only one spirit. The Holy Spirit, by the way, speaks to us through the word of God. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, you know, people get very confused about the day of Pentecost. They don't understand. What is the day of Pentecost all about? Well, you only have to keep reading. The Bible interprets the Bible. Joel tells us what is the meaning of Pentecost. Joel says this is that, which, excuse me, Peter, thank you. Peter tells us the meaning of the day of Pentecost. Peter says this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That little tiny book of Joel, only three chapters, is the day of judgment. This was the beginning of the day of judgment. But God put that day of judgment on hold. We've had amnesty for 2,000 years now. We have, we have this mystery program in place for 2,000 years. So all those temporary things have been shut down. Israel's program has been shut down. Speaking in tongues has been shut down. That's not the Holy Spirit today. I see people speaking in tongues today. That's not the Holy Spirit. And I was a baby Christian once. I was confused once. I went to a Pentecostal church a handful of times. I tried to speak in tongues as well. I didn't know any better. I'm a brand new believer in Christ. I don't know anything. And I listened to my sister-in-law, who also didn't know anything, even though she had been saved for a long time. And took me to a Pentecostal church. That's not the Spirit of God leading you. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us into all truth, not falsehood, not playing on our feelings and our emotions. Amen? Amen. So there is one body, there is one Spirit, there is one hope, and our hope is the resurrection. Our hope is the blessed hope. So if someone asks you, what is your hope as a Christian? My hope is the Lord Jesus Christ returning as promised to receive me unto himself. That's my hope. Our hope is his glorious return. That mystery that Paul talks about, the, the removal of the body of Christ, that is my hope. And if I should die, I'm 59, I don't know how long I'm going to be around. If the Lord should tarry and not come back real soon, like next week or next month, I'd love if he came today, by the way. But if, if he should delay, it's not up to me to decide. When he comes, he comes. I might fall asleep before he returns. That's okay. Because I'll be sleeping in the Lord. I'll be asleep in the Lord. Amen? Amen. So will you, if you go before he returns. So we have one body. We have one spirit. We have one hope. In verse 5, we see point number 4. There is one Lord. Amen. There is one sovereign Lord. Who is that sovereign Lord? It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We have one Lord. There are many lords, by the way, in the world. There are many people who claim to be the Lord. Many false messiahs out there. We've got this fellow in Mexico who says he is, he is Jesus Christ himself. He has thousands of people following him, by the way. I'm absolutely astonished that people can be deceived so easily into following a false Lord, a false Christ. And Jesus said, if someone else comes in my name, him you will receive. You reject me, but you'll accept just about anybody or anything else. My brother Julius and I were at the regional market yesterday, handing out tracts on the Bible, sharing the gospel, the word of God. And right next to
to our table was a very satanic booth with, with crystals and Ouija boards and all this occultism. And there are lots of people stopping at the occult table trying to get as much demonic material as possible and willing to pay good money for idols and statues, right? That's what, that's what it's all about. These folks are hungry to accept deception and a lie. And Satan is the god of this world, according to the word of God. And he's out there deceiving many. Our job is quite a task, folks. If we're going to be effective as members of the body of Christ, if the body of Christ is to be effective, we must maintain the unity of the Spirit. We've got to, we've got to be in one accord. We've got to recognize one body that says the exact same thing, the right division of Scripture. One body, we're all on the same page. Amen? Amen? Body of Christ has to be on the same page. Not all these denominations with all their different teachings and their doctrines and their, their religions is what they're spreading. There's only one body. There's only one spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that is found in Scripture in the Bible. Not this emotionalism that's in the church today. That spiritism, that's mysticism carried in from the cults that's infiltrated the church. And people have the audacity to call that the Holy Spirit because they're ignorant of the Word of God. That's not the Holy Spirit. There's one body. There is one spirit. There is one hope. And it's the correct teaching regarding the resurrection, the doctrine of resurrection. What happens when you die? You're dead until you're resurrected. There's no life after death until the resurrection occurs. You must be resurrected. Then you have life. Amen. There's one Lord, and His name is Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. Look in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. We get down to verse 14 and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled, he pitched his tent with us. That's what God did. God took on the form of a man. He put on this tent, this flesh. He became human. What does the Bible teach? That God, Jesus Christ, is fully God and fully man in one person forever. Fully human and fully God in one person forever. He's both. And what do all the cults teach? What do some of the denominations in their confusion teach? They say Jesus was just a good man. They say, oh, he was a prophet. They think they're being polite. That's what Islam says. Oh, we believe in Jesus. He was a prophet. Oh, oh not God, not God. Just a prophet. A good prophet. A great prophet. See, we're showing respect. No, you're marginalizing him. Because the Bible says he's God in the flesh. He's Almighty God. There should be no confusion on this point. And I had a Muslim friend. My Muslim friend said to me, can you show me where Jesus actually claims to be God? And I said, well, have you actually read the Bible? Because it's all over there. I don't know how you missed it. <laughs> Turn to Revelation. The book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, chapter 1. Verse 7 and 8. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Almighty. Did you miss that? <laughs> Did you miss that? Turn to John chapter 8, verse 58, where the Jews are questioning him and they say, Are you older than Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. And yet you say you're 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 greater than Abraham, you're before Abraham. And Jesus said, before Abraham sprang into existence, I eternally exist as the great I am. Yes. And they picked up stones to stone him to death. Because according to the law, you just can't run around calling yourself God. That was against Jewish law. You claim to be Yahweh, they pick up stones and they stone you to death. And so they should, if you're not who you are, who you claim to be. If you're not who you claim to be, they were right. Pick up stones. Take this guy out of there. He's missing a few screws. 
right? You can't say Jesus is a nice guy. No, he's God. And if you marginalize him by saying, well, he's just a prophet. Well, he's not the son of God. He, he, he was the carpenter's son. He was Joseph's little boy. He's just this or just that. Folks, you've missed the point here in verse 5. There's one Lord, and his name is Jesus Christ. Next we have one faith. What is the one faith that every member of the body of Christ is supposed to know and is supposed to share? What is the one faith? The one faith is that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. My brother Julius and I were in, we went Thursday night to the memorial service of a friend. And there was a minister up there preaching and teaching, and when he got through, he said, oh, and that was the gospel. My brother and I looked at each other and said, what gospel? We didn't hear any gospel in there. We heard him jumping around sharing different Bible verses, not rightly dividing at all. And then he said, aha, uh -huh, there, there, there was the gospel. I said, oh, there was no gospel there. How in the world would anybody have gotten saved listening to that? No way. There was no gospel presentation. There was no invitation to receive Christ. There was no 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And if you stop and ask most people, most Christians, most of them can't tell you what the gospel is. Most of them don't know. And when he says there's one faith, there is no longer the gospel of the kingdom. That was Peter's gospel. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Not for today, folks. That's the old program. That's to Israel, Jews living under the law. That's not for today. We have one faith today. What is the gospel today? What is the message today? It's the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. Paul mentions it by name in Acts chapter 20. Our gospel is called the gospel of the grace of God. You should know what the name of the gospel is. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. We're not Jews living under the law trying to usher in the kingdom on earth. You're off track if that's what you're thinking, folks. One gospel, one faith. What is our faith? The gospel of the grace of God. The end of verse 5, he says, this is our sixth point, point number six, there is one baptism. Oh, what a big issue that is. We need a lot of time to talk about this one, folks. Isn't it interesting that he says there's only one baptism? No, we have a track in the back there. And there's more than a dozen baptisms listed in the track. Right? You've got the baptism of John. You've got Jesus' baptism, which was different. Right? Jesus and John argued, and Jesus said, Suffer it to be so. I must fulfill all righteousness. He had to be baptized as part of the law of Moses. Then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Christ baptized on the day of Pentecost. He baptized them with the Holy Spirit. Now we're baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. That baptism, Christ was the agent of baptism. He baptized people with the Holy Spirit. Now, the one baptism that Paul's mentioning here in Ephesians chapter 4 is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. That baptism is our baptism. That's the one baptism that remains. All other baptisms don't count anymore, folks. People get so worked up, they want their pastor to baptize them. They want to be baptized into the church to join the church and be a member of the church. They feel like they're not really a Christian. They're not really saved until they get water baptized. Oh, folks, you couldn't be more wrong. There's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism today, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. Your pastor cannot help the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not need the help of your pastor. Right? Your pastor is not God. 
Your pastor cannot place you into Christ. Only the Holy Spirit has the power and the wisdom and the authority to place you into Christ as a member of the body of Christ. If we are to maintain the unity of the Spirit, if we are to maintain the unity that Paul's speaking about here, the unity of the Holy Spirit, we have to say the same thing. We have to understand the same thing. We have to be on the same page as Paul. We have to be Pauline in our theology, Pauline in our teaching, because our apostle is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And his gospel is the gospel that saves today. There is no other gospel that saves today other than Paul's gospel. And Paul calls it my gospel. He uses the personal pronoun my at least three times in scripture. He says my gospel. And Paul says be ye imitators of me. Be ye followers of me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Amen? Amen. And our final point, our final point in verse 6, he says, One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This is an amazing thing he's sharing with us here, folks. Do you know that you're permanently indwelled, not only with the Holy Spirit, but God the Son is in you. We are in Christ. The Holy Spirit has baptized us into Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Christ. And we have God the Father living in us. How are we going to walk worthy of our vocation? We got a lot of help, by the way. We got God the Father. We've got God the Son. We've got God the Holy Spirit. We have no excuse. We have no excuse for us. You know, we get weak sometimes. Oh, we all get weak. And we think about some sin which we just enjoy doing. There's some kind of payoff. Right? But we need to stop and remember we are in the presence of God Himself. He, in, he indwells us. He lives in us. We need to be conscious of His presence moment by moment in our lives. We need to walk with all holiness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another. How we treat other people is incredibly important. Incredibly important. You know, the world teaches you that you're number one. All that really counts is you, yourself, and I. Me, myself, and I. No, 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 folks, it doesn't work that way. We're to, we're to be long-suffering. We're to be forbearing one another in God's love, in God's grace, in God's kindness. That's our duty. That's our obligation as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to maintain the unity of the Spirit. How are we going to maintain the unity of the Spirit if we're in some denominational setting accepting teaching which does not line up with the Word of God. The very fact that you're in the denomination means you're out of order. You can't step in there and fix it. I tried to do that for years. And finally God said, come out from their midst and be ye separate. Then I will receive you. I don't want you inside the Baptist church trying to reform the Baptist church. I don't want you inside the Methodist church trying to change the Methodist church. I don't want you like Martin Luther inside the Catholic Church trying to bring reform to the church. I want you to step out from that denomination and to be separate. There's only one body, and that's the body of Christ. Amen. 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 Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, it's our hope and our desire to, number one, serve you and honor you. How can we serve you, Father? How can we honor you? We can maintain the unity of the Spirit. Father, we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us and to direct us and to lead us. Give us the courage and the strength to obey you, for obedience is better than sacrifice. Help us now, Lord, to obey, to hear, to understand, 
and to serve you in spirit and in truth. These things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.